I would have probably never started a podcast if I knew how much goes into a podcast. I probably wouldn't have been a designer if I knew what it takes and means to be a designer. This is a Jill Wade. She's also known as the toy coach. Like, don't over-research it before you start, because then you will never start. There are ideas I've had for my business, and when I over-research those ideas is when I don't do them. This designer and inventor, who has three patents to her name, is also backed with over a decade of experience in the toy industry, while she walked away from corporate to strike out on her own. I think you have to ask a lot of questions, especially early on when everyone expects you to not know everything. Like That's what I did. I asked a lot of questions, probably too many questions. I just didn't even care. When you're just getting started, it's hard to recognize your value and muster up the courage to make it happen. But Ajelle, she seems to know how to get results. Nobody and nothing outside of you is going to be able to tell you whether or not you should keep on going. On today's show, I speak with the toy expert and podcaster, Ajel Wade, about the ups, the downs, and the lessons learned as a creative entrepreneur. Ajel, you are a designer, you're a podcaster, and I'm going to stress this, you are creative, I'm stressing creative entrepreneur, best known as the toy coach. But here's what's super cool. As someone who left the world of corporate to take your hyper niche skills and experience, and then build out a coaching business, an education business, become a creator. I'm super curious. What part of this whole journey stretched you the most? The hardest part is definitely charging for what I'm worth. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Oh yeah. It's so hard. I hate it. I hate it. I hate when I, um, you know, put a price out there and there's amazing people that say that they can't afford it. Uh, this it's, I find it so hard to reach out to, to even corporations and say, Hey, I've got something great for you. You know, you should be sponsoring this episode or you should, uh, hold a scholarship. Like I do that. I hate that outreach. It's so uncomfortable. I don't like it at all. And as soon as I can, I will hire someone to do it for me. <laughs> well, I don't like it. Well, why is that? Do you like, you know what you're worth, which, which is, which is great to know. Do you feel like, like, asking for what you're worth, you're worried about the no, or you're worried about that we don't have budget right now for that, or are you worried about them not thinking that you're worth as much as you think you're worth? No, I'm worried about not living up to what I get paid. So oh. my students will tell you that I over deliver and there's a reason for it. Cause like, as soon as someone pays me, I'm like, okay, game on. I'm like, game on. What are we doing? How are we serving? How are we showing up? So yeah, I just, I want to make sure that people feel you know, money, it's hard to come by, you know, it's not easy to make a living. So if somebody's going to lay down, you know, their hard earned money for me, I just feel an immense responsibility to give them something of value. Oh, this, this has to be true to anyone in a creative field or even a design field, because it's easy for me to be like, Oh really? Why? And yet like, I'm like, I'm getting uncomfortable right now because right. I've run a creative agency for 15 years and I know I've undercharged on like everything we've ever done. <laughs> like, right. like even all of these years later, we, we, yeah. we get a project that's like, you know, multiple six figures. And we're like, yeah, you know, like we got a quarter million dollar project. Yay. But meanwhile, I'm delivering like a half million dollar project for a quarter oh million. So gosh. it's like, yes. it's like, it just, the money could go up, but but if you mm-hmm. still have this feeling inside where you're like you feel like you're you might fall short or you may not live up to expectations or you need to be cheaper, like you just deliver more and more and more, and it doesn't help you. Like, do mm-hmm. do, do you find that that's the case over over the last few years of your entrepreneurial journey? A hundred percent. Like it doesn't help at all because what happens is then I'll give myself over to maybe someone who's not paying or something that's free. And then I won't have the time available for people that are, that want to, you know, have me for a one-on-one or for a client that wants to hire me for a longer term project. Cause I'm like, Oh no, I just literally don't have the time in my schedule because I've committed myself to over delivering for too many things. So I, I just can't stand it. It's so hard. And that's the part I would not like to, I would like to not deal with. And so what's, what's your plan to, like you said, I I can't wait till I hire someone. Your plan is just, you're going to find like, I always say this in my business. I can't wait to get a shark, right? Like, like I need, cause, cause I I would just do everything for free. I would just give everything away. And I'm like, no, I need like someone who like really is a shark about this stuff. 
I don't think that's a good vibe for my culture, but what's mm-hmm. your answer? <laughs> so I'm, I'm really tempering how much I offer. So, you know, I have a program and in the program, I'm like, every week we're going to meet, we're going to be together. And then people are like, you know, but we want a cheaper alternative. So instead of just offering people exactly what they want, I have to think about, okay, Ajal, realistically, how many hours of your time will this take? And is it realistic to offer them a cheaper alternative at that current rate? So I'm just looking at it now as like, okay, how can I offer a little bit less time, give them the discount they want, give them the value that I think that they deserve and like just package all that up. So I'm trying to reduce time, my time in these different areas of my business so that I can, you know, make everyone happy and then also have the options where, okay, you want to invest more. You want more of my time. Like here's a higher ticket option for you, but I want some, I want there to be something for everybody. Maybe that's also (laughs) my problem. That's probably my problem as well. (laughs) Yeah. Especially when you know that up here in your head, you have the answer to the problems through your experience through uh, your contacts, through yeah. you've been there before, and you can just you can just see like oh, you know, a client or or friend or contact like you're in for a world of pain if you and, and I just I, I want to give it to you, I want to help you, but yeah. but I need you to be able to pay for it, and it's just right. it's an uncomfortable yeah. place to be, isn't it? It's so uncomfortable. <laughs> it's a, that's why I like corporations. You know, like nobody cares. You give them a proposal, they're like, "This isn't my money." Like you know, we'll we'll pa- we'll pass this on to whoever and see what happens. It's a little bit easier. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I've spent my career in corporate and I, I, I'd love to be able to dig into that with you because I know that, you know, your, your moving to being an entrepreneur has really happened over the last number of years. And starting out as a designer, moving into corporate and then moving into your own, gosh, mm-hmm. some big transitions. But part of, part of the conversations I'd love to have here on We Do Hard Things, as I was mentioning to you off camera, is this idea of pursuing your passion at all costs. And I'm making some assumptions here, but but maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. I have to imagine as a, a younger black woman growing up uh, who, you know, said you wanted to be a teacher, I, I got to think of being a teacher as a safe, predictable approach to career, to life. I'm up here in Canada. Teachers are very well paid. I know oh. that may not be the case in the States. <laughs> Different parts you of the got, world. You got healthcare included in that too, huh? <laughs> we a, yeah, we have a we, bunch we, of things. <laughs> right. Mm, no, not here. <laughs> but I have to imagine, and, and, and maybe this is the case, when you decide that you want to become a designer, like, like that has to be a hard decision, a hard conversation, because there is no clear path, really. I mean, there's graphic design and there's corporate marketing and social media and all this stuff, but it's still not the same as saying, like, I want to be a teacher or a mm. lawyer or a doctor or these kind right. of prescribed professions. How did how did you approach that decision? Oh, man, like, com- with complete naivety. <laughs> like, you know, had no idea what was going on. I actually, now that when you were saying that, I'm realizing a lot of the um, big leaps in my life and in my business happened because I was naive. I would have probably never started a podcast if I knew how much goes into a podcast. I probably wouldn't have been a designer if I knew what it takes and means to be a designer. But so for me, what happened is I studied, um, like studio art at my high school. They had a very, you know, high level studio art class for true artists. And I said, Oh, I love this. I want to do this, which I don't know why. Cause I wasn't that good at it, but I really wanted to do it. And then it came time like, okay, we got to apply for colleges. Uh, I loved the art world. I also loved computers. So I thought either I was going to go into art or I was actually going to go into like programming because I took like a preliminary programming class and I really loved it. So basically what chose, what decided my fate was the price of education here in the U.S. So I researched a bunch of colleges and I found two that I literally did the math and I was like, okay, if I go to this school for four years, this is how much it's going to cost. And if, if the worst case scenario happens and I need to work at Starbucks to pay this back, this is how long it's going to take me to pay it back. So I was like, okay, my two options were the Fashion Institute of Technology and SUNY Purchase. So that kind of decided everything. So then I'm looking at the major options and I'm looking, so I was thinking of doing like costume design at SUNY Purchase and like set design. And then I was looking at FIT and looking at exhibition design, um, packaging design, all these other things. So I thought exhibition design would give me a really well-rounded be- like uh, experience as a designer because I would do 2D and 3D design. So I was like, I can do a lot with that. So that's where I went. 
And then I also, because I'd always wanted to be a teacher in the past before the sixth sense ruined my dreams of like being a child psychologist <laughs> and being a teacher, um, <laughs> that horrifying scene, uh, I always wanted to work with kids. So I would apply kids stuff like play and the idea of like what kids need to engage to all of my designs at FIT. And that kind of led me into the toy industry and led a teacher to tell me about the toy industry. So it was a little bit of money, a little bit of happenstance and a little bit of passion kind of mixed up to get me where I but, am. But you, so, so it's interesting to me that you're like, oh, I wasn't very good at it. So there must've been some yeah. kind of, <laughs> some kind of wind behind your sails that was help pushing you forward. No. Uh, I honestly think I liked people not believing in me and showing and proving them wrong because ah. I had a team, you know, <laughs> 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 um, I don't know what it was. I think, yeah, no, I really don't know why I wanted to do it. I wasn't that good. I mean, I could draw things that I saw. I got really good at being able to like replicate what I saw, but when it came to come up with your own artistic vision, I was just completely blocked and I would do stuff and it would just not hit and the teacher like really didn't love it. She even told me I wouldn't be able to get into FIT, which just made me want to get in there more. And yeah, so I don't know why. I don't I was just feisty. I guess. Oh, that's so it's 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 funny to me because uh I I wanted to become an engineer and an architect for as long as I can remember. I grew up in a construction family of developers and oh. and so when I was a kid I used to I used to take chart paper and draw out like floor plans and, and all of this stuff. That's and I was cute. like I love environment. I love light. I love space. Even today, I love being in places because it's just like, I don't know. I just, I wanted to be an architect. And then um, I realized, oh, this is really hard. And so right. I went to film school instead because I, <laughs> quite honestly, I was afraid and I thought it would be easier. And right. when I was making that decision, my mom was like, well, you know, like similar thing. You know, uh, film school is is much shorter. I went to a private college, much cheaper, uh, lower investment. It's 18 months of your life. She's like, if you do it and it doesn't work out for you, then no one can take that away from you. But that thing that I didn't think about way so long ago and yet took us down this path um, was part of that, like something to prove. You know, my, oh. my grandmother said to me, because again, construction family, she said, right. she said, well, you're young enough that when you fail, you can go out and get a real job. Oh my God. Like, like, ow, Oma, <laughs> what are you doing to me? Like, like that's not great. But, oh my but gosh. so you, you go into design. Um, now, toys is like such a weird place to be. And now, You've dedicated your life to it. I mean, you help. You, you, you're, you're named on patents. You've helped yeah. design toys. You have a podcast about toy design and production. You coach people through toy design and production. What is it about play and and even because I see it as a manufacturing process or an industrial right. design process? I have a friend who right. owns a toy company, so it's like the oh, the, the, the magic has I been. Didn't know that. <laughs> the magic oh, has cool. been worn off for me seeing some of the uh -huh. behind the scenes stuff, but what is it about play yeah. and design and all this that just lights you up? I love kids. So that's what happened. <laughs> so I just think they're so cute and they're so fun and they're so weird and just the way that they think and the things that they do and the imagination they have. Um, so I don't know. I just love the imagination of kids and that led me to toy. It wasn't really like the other way around. Um, yeah. So that's what, that's what happened. I kind of like working in this industry. I like the discovery process. I like that you get to still be a kid. You come up with ideas in the way that kids play, or at least I do where, you know, I'm just kind of exploring with different materials and seeing what clicks and what works. And then I love, like my favorite part is just when you send a plan drawing over to a factory and they send you back a sample and you see what you've actually made come to life. Like that's my absolute favorite part. Um, so yeah, I just love, I love kids first and then, then toys kind of came after that. <laughs> what is yeah. it? I mean, it makes sense that you wanted to be a teacher and, yeah. and it's, it's, it's funny because now you are a teacher, right? Like, right. like, like you're, you're a coach, you're a teacher, you're, you're out there, you're, you're drawing all of your, the experience of design, the experience of, of kids, the experience of being a teacher, the experience of toys, you're drawing it all together at this point in your life yeah. to do your own thing, which is which is super badass and inspiring. I mean, Thank how you. many people want to be able to say that they've done the things that you've done, that they're pursuing their, 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 their dream or their passion as scary as it is, as hard as it is, you're doing it. And yeah. so what is it about, again, cause I have four kids. Um, oh, you have four kids. Oh. 
I, I, I do not play, you know, like, like I work and, um, I take on challenges and I, and I have fun. Yeah. But w- my wife and I always felt bad because we were the type of parents where our kids would come to us and be like, can we play? And we'd be like, we'll sit here and watch you play or oh like, gosh. I'll talk to you while you play or what you can describe what you're doing. But like, mm-hmm. You know, I'm I'm staring at a whole bunch of board games that we never play. At what? like, I just, oh, you're I just killing me, <laughs> you're killing me. So, what is it about it that just that you love? It's it's just it's freeing and it's easy and it's creative and it it you know I don't know it's comforting and it's interactive. Like I, we have um in in our home, me and my fiance, we have a lot of toys and a lot of games. We have this whole like um uh, coffee table just filled with board games. And whenever we're feeling like we're kind of in a rut in life, you know, you can get into that habit of like, go to work, come home, you know, watch TV, clean the house, go to sleep, right? I mean, we don't have kids yet, so that's all we do. But, you know, um, whenever we feel like we're in that rut, you know, break out a board game and it just completely changes how you interact with each other and how you spend your time. And it allows time to slow down in a way that when you're watching TV and you're scrolling on your phone, like time just seems to vanish. And when you're sitting there trying to figure out this like strategy back to the future board game, you're, you know, you're really in the moment, you're competitive, you're engaging with each other, you're connecting over something that you love. If it's like a licensed game like that, I don't know. It's just, it brings you back to like easier times to simpler times. And it just makes you appreciate life instead of, uh, what I feel like TV and, um, Instagram, they, they make you feel like your life that you have isn't enough and you need to like look outward for things, but board games and toys just make you present. Maybe I'm not very good at that. (laughs) 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 I I agree with what you're saying. And I'm like, yeah, I want, I want better relationships and creative thinking and I want to have fun and release and relax and all of this stuff. And I'm just like, Ah, huh, okay. So I have homework for myself. <laughs> it does take a minute because I remember in like a month, couple months ago, I realized we were watching a lot of TV and my fiance goes, let's play a board game tonight. And I was like, oh, Ugh, really? work. Like, <laughs> I don't want to learn rules right now. And then he was like, let's do it. And then we, we did it. And I was like, oh, this is actually really nice. It uses a different part of your mind. And it does take you a minute to get into though. So like, you're not alone. Some, you just, sometimes you got to power through it to get to the fun, you know, <laughs> power you, through the pain. So you find yourself working at Toys R Us. You decide, you know, that, that you're a designer, uh, you, you love kids, you find toys. How, what, what happened at Toys R Us? And ultimately, how did that project you into becoming an entrepreneur? Ooh, uh, so at Toys R Us, oh man. So I've always actually had an entrepreneurial business on the side of my full-time job. So while I was at Toys R Us, I had a company called Costumize Me. And it's like a convertible event wear thing. I just sold pieces on the side. Uh, but while I was working at Toys R Us, I was so busy. I could not work on that company at all. Uh, I was just in charge of the Girls World brands, which is like private label uh, girls. I mean, they don't theme them anymore like this, but the girls activity and girls uh, doll brands in Toys R Us. So it was like, just like home, you and me, Journey Girls, which is like 18 inch dolls, play sets, um, uh, toys that would let kids like pretend like they're their parents, like cleaning toys and things like that. So I did design management for all those brands. And I was also the product manager for Totally Me, which was an arts and crafts brand. And I got to tra- travel to China, come up with ideas. It was a lot of fun. Um, but what happened was Toys R Us had some financial issues here in the U S. So then they just shut the doors and you know, that was such a huge loss because, you know, working in corporate, everything is, while you might have a lot of work and there's a lot of red tape, you've got great insurance. (laughs) You've got, you're making the big bucks, you know, you're saving, like everything is easy peasy. Then, you know, cut to having to leave Toys R Us. Um, I started working at smaller companies where I would get a lot more responsibility. I became a VP of brand and product at a a company called Creative Kids. Um, But it was just a touch a different experience because when you're at these smaller companies, they're still doing major volume and you've got a lot of responsibility that now you have to build a team to manage. Like there's no system for you like at the, the major corporations. So I think that experience... 
Um, I went through some personal things where I like came out over some health issues and all, I think all of it just kind of mixing together started to make me realize that I wasn't really building anything for myself, but I was spending so much time and energy building things for the people I was working for. So, and at what point is that, is that no longer (laughs) rewarding though? Because big company yet you have the resources, but the red tape and they move really slow and you spend a lot of times managing up and politics and, and, oh, this thing happened in China and you know, like the factory and this is your responsibility, small company. Yay. You get to run with it. But as you mentioned, I mean, none of that stuff, but the, the output's the same. Right. So uh, (laughs) at what point does it, does it just become, is it, is it because of the health issues? Is it because you were working through, like, what point is it just like, I'm, I'm over this. I'm going to spend my time on my things. Right. Well, to back up a little bit, I should clarify the, the health issues that I had them in Toys R Us and they, and they did change one specific thing. Um, I had gotten diagnosed randomly with this cancer. And then luckily it was very rare form. They did surgery. They were like, you're okay. You're good to go. After like a month of finding out I had cancer, I was like, fine. So that was cool. Um, but it did scare the living daylights out of me and made me want to focus more on the company I had at the time costumize me because I just felt like I wanted to build something for myself, but at the same time I wanted to grow in the toy industry. So I was like, Oh, I have two jobs to do. I'm going to work really hard all the time. Toys R Us closes and I start doing, you know, working for this next company, growing their brands, don't have time to do my own business anymore. And then the pandemic hits, right? So I start spending a lot of time at home because we're all working from home. And that made me realize how much time I don't spend at home. And that, that was the first catalyst to making me think like, maybe I need to start my own business because this is crazy. Like, how can I be working this hard? And I have never seen my fiance now, boyfriend then, as much as I've seen him in this time. I've never been at my home this much. And what is the point of working this hard and having, and like barely having money because transportation transportation in New York is very expensive. So like when I was at home, I'm like, wait a second, this is a totally different life. Could I have this life if I worked for myself? So that's kind of why I started and I tried it and it's going okay. Yeah. Nice big questions to ask yourself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so uh, actually bef- before we move on, cause we're going to in a second, sure. Um, sure. I actually have a connection to Toys R Us. I was in their commercials when I was five years old. Oh my, wait, <laughs> no, really? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Up here, up here for the Christmas campaign. Uh, they brought what? me out onto set and I got oh to sit in gosh. a power wheels. I, I forgot about this till you mentioned Toys R Us. I sat in a power wheels and I got to like, Dry, like you know how they would have all the play and then at the end they would there'd be like the christmas tree and the price yeah. would come up and I they just needed they just needed someone to sit there with the toys so so it was like yeah i, I got to drive the power wheels i got to drive that little that little car that you pedal with that that would take yeah. you places we got to do all this stuff and oh yeah that's so i need to see that clip <laughs> uh, i would love to see it too my mom taped it on vhs because i'm old oh my God. Uh, oh I remember taking it in in junior kindergarten to show my class. And then when I was oh much older, gosh. I asked her for a copy of it. And she said, oh, I taped over that a long time ago. <gasps> so- <laughs> I found things of me on TV on YouTube. So we well, should what do were some you YouTube doing on TV? TV? I was on Sesame Street for a couple of years. So a couple years. <laughs> <Yeah>. What? <laughs> that is so cool. I watched Sesame Street until uh, I, I don't know if I should say this out loud. I watched Care Bears and Sesame Street until I was 13. Which oh is like too God. old, but I, <laughs> oh, I, I, that's I, so nice. Yeah, I was. I, I think I was in like grade seven or eight. I think yeah, when I stopped watching Sesame Street. Maybe like, that's why you don't play as much right now because you like got a lot in really like in the early half of your life. So you're just like you know what? I'm good. I really did it hard early on. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever found that you're that you're that, that the creativity, the very thing that serves you, is also the thing that holds you back? Yeah. Well, it stops me. I think the creativity is why I over deliver. Like I, I keep getting ideas of like new things to do. It's very distracting. So it's hard to stay focused. I, I was, I was thinking that, you know, obviously your commitment to going into design and exploring that, pursuing your passion 100% at that point in your life, yeah. um, going into, going into toys and being able to, to dedicate a career to that, especially when it lit you up and fired you up. Cause I know lots of people yeah. in that industry who are not in love with kids and they're not in love with play and they're not in love with toys. They, Oof. it's just like, again, right. it's, it, if, if you strip it away, it, it becomes a process of uh, design and then prototyping 
and then deciding on, you know, should this be plush or injected molding? You know, are right. we going to hand paint things? How are we going to package right. it? How are we going to ship it? What's the deadlines? What's the, the unit cost or weight? Like, it becomes a manufacturing process. And if, if you look at it that way, it is it is not a fun manufacturing process from what I understand. Um, but but now as an entrepreneur, you are are doing, and I don't know if people tell you this, but you are doing things that, that hundreds of thousands of people want to be able to do, right? To be able to leave corporate, to be able to step out on your own and build your own thing and even do a podcast and do social and become a coach and put yourself out there, especially when it's crafted around the very thing that you've spent the last, you know, decade plus focusing on. Right. Most people either don't think they can do it mm. or or think maybe it's just for others or they don't have the courage to do it, but, but you're out there doing it now. Do you do you kind of see in yourself what a big step that even is? No. No, I don't. I'm it seems reckless from my perspective, but why? What's reckless about it? Because you know you have the ability to bring your family a weekly or biweekly paycheck, and you opt to not do that, and instead you opt to like figure something else out. So, in my opinion, it's a little bit reckless. Um, but I guess if I were giving advice to people, I would just say like, don't over research it before you start, because then you will never start. There are ideas I've had for my business, and when I over-research those ideas is when I don't do them. If I had over-researched podcasting, I would not have done it. If I'd over-researched how to create a course, I would not have made a course because that stuff will scare you out of action. So sometimes you just got to – I guess the best thing to do is like look at your end goal and just say like, okay, how important is this end goal of – financial freedom or time freedom. Like how important is that for me? Is it important enough that I'm willing to sacrifice this amount of my savings or this amount of my time developing my career to see if I can make something work? And then like, if it is, take a leap and give it a try and try to follow the people that can help guide you there. But um, yeah, don't over over research. Google is not always your friend. Oh no, Web WebMD not your friend. <laughs> oh my gosh, Google, same thing. You know, it can oh my it can be a huge challenge. Now, yeah, I, I love the idea of 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 nave, nativi, nativity. Na- I know for some reason I can't pronounce it today. Naivete. Na- naivete. Na- na- naivete. Yes, I, yeah. I love the idea of that because um, you have actually articulated something that I realized when I started my what? agency in 2006. Everyone's like, "You're such a risk taker," and I'm yeah. like, "Entrepreneurs do not start out as risk takers." We are foolish. <laughs> like, like it's not it's not that it's like I am more o- – now, today I'm way more open to risk than I was. But right. I foolishly believed that I could do it better. I foolishly believed that, that hard work um, w- would lead to like way more freedom and way more money. And by the time I realized that, <laughs> that that's not the case right away – uh, I was too deep into it. Exactly. Like exactly <laughs> and it was that. like, oh, I can't go back now. Now, I don't say that to discourage anyone from starting. No, I'm yeah. just saying, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, if you're like, I'm not a risk taker, neither are we. No, we're not. We're just takers. like, we're just like, we're, hey, <laughs> like excitement and passion and like Maybe foolish. too prideful. <laughs> too prideful. We're too proud of ourselves. We're like, we know we could do this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's like, and and then you get into it and you learn and you grow. And at a certain point, you know, people always say it's, it's about the journey, not the destination. I was like, forget that. But, but now that I'm 15 years into it, because I started in 2006, my agency. 15 years in? Oh my goodness. I've realized that it is the journey. Did you start out of the womb? (laughs) I was 23. Yeah. I was 23 when I started my agency and um, I'm turning 39 shortly, which which wow. I was saying the other day, like, just, oh, gosh, that makes me feel old. Oh, because, no, 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 no. Well, uh, when I started dating my wife, her parents were 39, and I'm turning oh, 39. Wow. So, oh, actually, might even be more than that, because we've been together oh 22 years gosh. now. So, oh, yeah. Your life is so sweet. Oh, this is adorable. <laughs> okay. That's yeah, so yeah. cute. High school it's sweethearts, cute. four kids. That's, oh, my that's the thing. Like, you can, you can show that projection of anything, but the truth is... Um, the reason why I think it is the journey more than anything else is because when you're growing and you're st- and you're stacking success, so so you start your business, you start your career, and you start to get these wins, right? Like you stick with it, you get these wins. It is an upward trajectory until it's not, and at a certain point, it won't be because you'll make big mistakes. Yeah, you'll face major setbacks. 
and, and suddenly you have a choice. It's like, do I want to be, do I want to frame that as like, I made a huge mistake and I'm such a loser and all of this stuff? Or do you want to just say, well, I guess I'm learning and getting stronger and getting better. And, and if you're not going to give up, you have to choose the I'm learning, I'm stronger, I'm getting better, in which case it is about the journey. Oh. And so in your journey over even the last few years uh, mm. as an entrepreneur, as a creative, what do you think you've learned the most so far? You know, you really can't look outward for the answer to if you should continue your journey. I still try to do that and it's it never works. And my fiance is at the point where he's like, I don't know why you keep asking me because you're not going to listen to what I... <laughs> <laughs> what I'm telling you to do. So like when you get to those like impasses, those crossroads, I've just realized you've got to find an internal, like, I don't know, what do they call it? Like barometer to figure out like whether or not this is still the right path for you. Nothing, nobody and nothing outside of you is going to be able to tell you whether or not you should keep on going. Like I've had moments where I wake up in the morning and like an amazing opportunity pops in my inbox and the day is roses. And then like halfway through the day, like, I don't know, a client will fall through or something will just cancel. And then like the day is horrible. And like, I shouldn't even do this anymore. And then I just realized like, that's not a healthy way to be. So you have to have this like internal, like steady belief that this is what you're going to do. And you've got to have the things that are going to help you get back to that feeling when you're feeling off track. So this morning I woke up and put on a motivational playlist because I needed that. Sometimes you just need that support. Now let's, let's break through some of the, the glossy parts then. Okay. Right. Because again, I've, I've actually, I was first introduced to you because I saw your interview on Marie Forleo podcast oh. and, and I was like, I was like, Oh, who is, who is this person? And, and what, a what a strange conversation, like, you know, <laughs> talking about creativity and toy design and creative teams yeah. and entrepreneurship and just like yeah. the gamut of, of cool things, you know, people, I, I mean, they must look at you just with admiration, whether you want to accept it or not. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when you start to break down some of those things, uh, you are, you are, you have a, a super cool niche. Uh, you have great experience. Um, you're presenting yourself in a great brand. You're, you're on all of these great platforms in this, in this big, you know, other platforms that are huge. So from the outside, it seemed like, again, like you came from nowhere. It's like, it's like the band that wins. <laughs> it's like the band yeah. that wins the Grammy for, for, for new band of the year. And they're like, yeah, we've been doing this for 12 years. <laughs> like, right. yeah. So, so what do you think though, if, if you looked at yourself from the outside, what do you think is the thing that people are gravitating towards? Oof, it might be the hair. I don't know. You think so? <laughs> it could be the hair. Uh, well, I have asked this question of some people cause I was trying to figure it out myself. I'm like, I don't know why I'm why people like to hear from me so much. But um, I do know that the the inspiration and the education is a, is a huge part of what people in the toy industry like to hear from me. So it's that feeling of like, here's some information that you might not have known about the toy industry, but also here is some motivation so you know that you're not alone and you can do this. And that for my students and for people that just listen to my podcast seems to be what they really need and what is so lacking. Um, but then I, which also is, feel which like is I, what, oh, sorry ahead. to interrupt, we'll circle go around ahead. on answering the rest of that, but what is that motivation that that's lacking? Because the toy industry is so closed off. It's such a boys club. I mean, I guess now so less, but it was such a boys club and it wasn't really open to minorities. So, you know, there wasn't really a lot of a way to get a lot of information, and then there was nobody saying like, yeah, yeah, come, come into this industry, you know, and telling you like, it's not going to be easy, but it can be fun. There just isn't that. So I'm giving that. And I think that's what people enjoy. Okay. And, and now to let you get back to what you were yeah. saying about why oh, people yeah, are attracted that? to you. Oh yeah. I don't know. I, oh, I also feel like I might just be, have been a little bit lucky with like timing because I'm the black lives matter movement happened a few months after I started my business. So because of that, like people were more open to featuring black people and almost like desperate to feature black people on their different outlets. So I feel like that definitely played a part in just giving me more opportunity. One particular, I won't name the show, but I remember I pitched a show and they didn't love my idea and they, but they responded and they said, we don't love that idea. Cause we have another idea that's similar to that coming up soon. 
Um, but why don't, but we'll touch back base with you in a few months. And they didn't. And I think I followed up or they followed up after the movement blew up. And then they worked with me to figure out a topic that would fit. And like, you know, like podcasters don't do that, especially big podcasters. They're not going to work with you to figure out like what you're going to talk about on their show. I think that's something that happened because of the movement, because of people trying to uplift black people. Some of these opportunities I don't think would have happened otherwise. So yeah. And how do you feel about that? Because, because part of me goes, okay, uh, yeah. you know, there's this, this great book that I love that I'm not going to keep mentioning because I mentioned on every episode, but okay. this great book I love where, <laughs> well, you where love it. yeah, I love it <laughs> where he, he talks about, um, he talks about like, listen, it's stupid not to use what you've got. Right. Right. There's, you know, the world is full of people with curly hair, with, with iron, with, with like hair straighteners. And yet tons of people would love to curly hair that they have just like use what you've got. Right. So yeah. you've got it. But on the other side, I feel so uncomfortable feeling like, you know, it's like, oh, perfect. We're looking for black, young, hip, yeah. female minority, well spoken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and doesn't that just like me. tokenize you? <laughs> and like, ha like, so do you fall in the camp of like, I'm going to ride it. I've got it. Or do you like, does it make you uncomfortable? Well, it's kind of different because it's like it all, it evolved. I think from naive, naivete, naivete, it evolved because at first I was just making a podcast um, and then I didn't want people to know who I was because I thought they wouldn't take me as seriously. Eventually I said like who I was and some people were weird about it when they found out who I was. Um, but when, when I started saying like who I was, I was trying to gain more attention for the podcast. I was going out publicly and talking about it. Um, and at first... I wasn't thinking about the fact that I was black. It was more that it was like the toy industry. So I was using the toy industry. People were like, oh, you want to talk about toys on my podcast? I'm like, yes, let's do that. So I was using that and that didn't feel bad. Then Black Lives Matter happened and other people were telling me to use it. Like people were like, you better email this podcast right now. I was like, they were like, everybody wants black people just get in there. And I was like, okay. So I was like, I'll do it. Um, and the only time I feel weird or bad about it is just when I know great people in the toy industry that aren't getting that visibility because they just didn't try for it. Um, but at the same time, like, what am I going to do? Like hold myself back because the rest of the world doesn't want to put themselves out there or other people don't want to do that. No. So what I do instead is my platform like brings together and lifts up people whenever I can, but I, you know, I'm going to use what I've got. Otherwise I'll just keep being unknown. Like I was for the 10 years of my, of my career in the toy industry. Well, and, and so, so maybe there's something to this or maybe not, but you know, being a, a female, being a woman in the boys club of the toy industry, um, being a black woman, uh, and then breaking out on your own. I mean, like, it's just like, this is a, maybe I shouldn't say this out loud. This is a, this is a terrible, um, inside joke that advertisers have always said, right? Which what? is when you're casting for any kind of spot or any kind of commercial. Um, I mean, there's a reason why you want diversity because you want everyone to feel included. But if you're really cynical about it, and this is not how I feel. I'm going to, I'm going to just keep hedging oh, <laughs> super strong, but it's like, that. it becomes a certain point where, where people are like, well, can we just have the person in the wheelchair also be from, you know, like, can we, can we start to overlap some of these things? And it's just right, like, right. Oh, like you guys are missing right. the point of right. like telling rich stories from different perspectives of different people. So that way we can gravitate towards it. Like in, in your career, is this not something you had to fight against? Oh yeah, for sure. There were, I did a whole podcast episode on the ripple effect of racial bias in the toy industry. Um, yeah, there were, I was in some meetings that were very offensive where people would just be like, we don't need to make a black version of this doll. I'm like what? There would be times where, where I would see the black doll be placed at the bottom. Like, so when you're in a toy store, there's like different shelves, right? And whatever product is at eye level typically sells more because it's at eye level and the product managers or brand managers determine where things are placed on that shelf or the buyers. It depends on the company really. Um, so I remember seeing like in these planogram rooms, like a doll line, the same doll line having all the white or light skin dolls. Actually they were all the white dolls at eye level. And then all of the minority dolls at the bottom. And I was like, what the heck is this? What kind of bull is this? And it was just normal. It was just accepted, which is bizarre. So yeah, that happened a lot. I've had 
because I'm light skinned, certain people tend to think that I don't know. They think they can say certain things to me that, that they shouldn't say. I don't think that they realize like I'm black sometimes, or they don't realize how black my family is just because I'm light skinned doesn't mean my whole family looks like this. Um, so yeah, I, uh, yeah, yeah. I had some weird, weird interactions in the toy industry. I, I, I understand play. I understand creative thinking. I understand design thinking, design, all that stuff. Um, but, but you're, you're great at building kind of creative teams. Hmm. What goes into that and how's that different from kind of the normal team building approach? Well, I think it's different because when, when I'm building a creative team, I still want the person, the creative to have some sort of a business mindset. And I'm thinking specifically about when I worked, well, honestly, no, I'm, I'm that way with every, everywhere I've worked. I want somebody that has a business mindset. I don't want to hire a creative who does not think about how much things cost to manufacture. I don't want to hire a creative who's not thinking about marketing. Like what are the big wow factors of this toy product? I, whenever I hire creatives, I want them to be thinking about the business behind the cre- the artwork or the product that they're designing. Um, like what is the reason for it? Like, how is this driving business? I want them to understand that and have like pride in that. I think it's better for them and their career, but it's definitely better for me or whatever company I'm hiring you for, for you to be informed. Yeah. Why do you think designers miss this? Cause I, I, um, I have a client that is a retail, uh, in design builder. So they, they right. build out retail locations and there's this old joke that the owner used to tell where they were doing this huge program for this massive company. And the designer that was brought in from France designed shelves with um, no mounting points. So there was like, they, so, wow. so they designed this beautiful series of shelves that not okay. only could not be built, it couldn't be mounted and it couldn't hold any weight. Oh. And so the joke was like floating shelves. Like just for mm-hmm. years, they made fun of designers because they're like, oh, I guess another set of floating shelves. Right. Um, so, so I think anyone who's entrepreneurial on the business side uh, knows the importance of balancing business, the business aspect with the design aspect. Mm-hmm. But, but how, how does one, you know, if you're, if you're starting out or if you're even newer at this, how does one go about kind of recognizing the importance of both and balancing that? Mm, I, I think you have to ask a lot of questions, especially early on when everyone expects you to not know everything. Like that's what I did. I asked a lot of questions. I just didn't even care. I would, when I would send something to a factory in China, cause early on in my career, I felt like I got way more, um, responsibility than I probably should have had. <laughs> I was like, when, when I look back, I'm like, oh, they let me like cost things out with a factory when I had no idea what that even really meant. So I remember, uh, early on, just when I would send something to a factory, I, and they would send me back like costs that I wasn't expecting. I'd be like, why does it cost that much? And then I'd be like, why did you change my design? Or I'd say like, why is this material look different? And their answers would be like, oh, we changed your design because the hinge was going to be too weak because the hinge was too small and the, and the lid is too big. Or they would say like, we changed it um, from ABS to PP because of the cost you want, the price you wanted PP was uh, polypropylene would be a lot cheaper. So that's what I did. I asked a lot of questions, like probably too many questions. And you learn a lot through that. Um, I think designers have a tendency to, maybe it's pride. So like they give in a design and then it goes off and either gets priced or gets reviewed by the CMO and it changes and it comes back to them and they say, this is the new design. And the designer has a tendency to just be like, oh, okay, got it. But that's where I ask, like, okay, no problem. I'm just wondering why. Like, I want to know, like, for the future, how can I learn from what you've changed so that I can deliver better designs like this in the future? That is such a great skill. So so if if you're listening now and you want, you know, maybe you're a creative yourself, but maybe you have to manage designers or creatives because, frankly, you know, in the world we're living in, whether whether you're just putting out social posts or whether you're trying to launch something brand new, design is is everywhere. It's it's a key oh aspect gosh. of everything that we do everywhere all the time, and it can't be ignored. And so I think more often we have non-designers managing designers, and what you're talking about is just such a frustrating process where where there's a certain, um, I call it like purity, like, like there are things that we can compromise on that don't kind of like ruin the purity of or, or the, the mission or the, the feeling that we're going for. And then there's other things where you're like, you can't, you can't possibly do that. Yeah. How do you help 
non-designers or what's your advice for non-designers managing designers? I do have this. So I literally wrote a portion of my courses about this because I say to my students like, okay, if you're going to hire a designer to help design your toy for you, they're going to know more than you and you have to be the creative director. And that's really hard. So basically what, uh, there's a couple of things. So let me think about them. Okay. So to start, you have to have kind of a vision of what you want your end product to be, whether it's a napkin ske sketch plus a mood board, you have to have a general idea to make sure you and the designer are working toward the same goal. Um, that's number one. Then when it comes back to you, I think if you're not a designer, at the very least, you need to understand some basic elements of design, like balance, unity, harmony, um, and the reason you want to understand those principles of design, I said elements, but they're principles of design is because it'll allow you to communicate better with the designer when you don't like something as to why you don't like it. So instead of saying like, this drawing is weird, I don't like it. You have to be able to say this drawing feels off balance because this right side looks so much bigger than the left side. Like you have to be able to be very specific as to why you don't like it so that you're giving the designer enough information to kind of infer what it is you really want. You need their experience and you need their expertise, but they can't apply that if you can't articulate what it is that is wrong or is right with what they're producing for you. So... Is it is the whole, like, I don't know what I like, but I know what I don't like approach, oh. which drives designers just batty because you're endlessly searching for something. Is that even yeah. fair in your mind, in your mind? Is that yeah, a, even no. a fair approach to like, just, just keep showing me. And, and I, I don't really know what I want, but, but I'm, but I'm definitely going to tell you the stuff I don't want. Well, if you have the money to spend on revision, sure. Like you go for it. Like, <laughs> and that's also something I teach my students. I'm like, it is going to cost you. You have to figure out how many revisions you get in that first price uh, estimate that you get from a designer. Because beyond that, if you still don't know what you want, you're going to pay for it. So yeah, if you got the money, go for it. Um, but then let the designer know upfront that this is like exploratory. I have no idea what I want. You know, here's some things I think I like help. That's a different conversation than I know I want to make a Barbie doll. Can you draw me this Barbie doll that looks like, I don't know, Cadet Kelly. I don't know why that's in my head, but whatever. So <laughs> Who's so, Cadet Kelly? Oh, that's um, Hillary Duff's character on a TV show. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah. So like th those are two different um, design jobs and they're totally both valid, but you should definitely go in from the beginning, letting a designer know like what kind of job this is. Is this an exploration job or is this, I know what I want kind of job. And at any point when you were, you know, starting out at school and design, when you were in corporate, when you're in smaller corporate, when you're stepping out, you know, now and doing your own thing at any point during this journey, did you feel like, like you've got this or has it just been an endless amount of like standing on quicksand? No, I definitely had moments where I felt like I'm so good at this. Yeah, for sure. Especially when like you get on a major podcast or you're on TV, you're like, oh yeah, I am the toy coach, you know? Um, and then, <laughs> and then, and then, I don't know, you, you don't have as many students as you'd hoped, or, you know, you don't have scholarships you'd hoped for or maybe an opportunity that like no one else knew was going on fell through. Uh, so yeah, I had moments where I'm like, I got this. And then other moments where I'm like, oh no. <laughs> and you sing your way through both of them? <laughs> oh yeah, I like to sing, so. <laughs> so. So what is your favorite type of toy then? Ooh, I love arts and crafts toys. I know people don't always consider them toys, but that's what I did for a big chunk of my career, arts and crafts products. And it's also what I grew up playing with the most. I, I like burned my finger off in a wood burning kit once. Good times. I learned how to knit. Good times. You know, what, I like what, arts what was the, um, the thing I used to love was, I think it was called spirograph, right? Like you, you, oh, put, you yeah. put the pen in and you yes. like go around in circles and it creates yeah, yeah, these yeah. cool kind of shapes. Yeah. yeah. I had a travel cool version of that. Um, mm -hmm. when I was very young, does not work in the back oh. of a minivan on your way to Florida. Oh. It's just like no. too many bumps. Maybe, it's like, you can't, maybe what's the that's point? an innovation that needs to happen. Somebody <laughs> needs to come up with the one that does work on travel or the, cars. uh, the sand thing, right. The, that you would shake the etch-a-sketch. I think it is. Etch -a -sketch. Right? Oh, the, I, I was so bad at the etch-a-sketch. I could not figure it out. I was horrible. Nobody's good at that. Mm -hmm. I've seen some things. 
Have you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there, yeah there's things. But. I love it. I love it. So uh, just final question, because it's been so much fun to be able to dig into Aww. your story and to learn all of these great lessons. But for you, and I ask this of everybody, at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? Ooh. Building a family. Isn't that so cheesy? I'm so lame. <laughs> Why? Why is that important to you? I just... You know, I had like a, oh, I had much fine childhood, um, but my family is not as like, they're not like super family oriented. We're very independent, um, but I was lucky to find a lovely partner who is like very family oriented. And I just love like his whole family vibe. And I just have increasingly wanted to create something like that of my own. So now, you know, that we're engaged, I'm just like, everything I do, I try to think like, well, this um, benefit or lead to us being able to have a life where we can have that like family bond. So sometimes I even think like with the toy coach, maybe it's never this like massive, massive, you know, thing, but if it could allow me to like stay home with our future potential children and still do this business on the side, that could be beautiful too. Just being able to like be there for them more. And, and I don't know. So like, I think about that. Yeah. Well, you're a creator and you're creating this business and you can create it to be anything you want it to be. Right. Yeah, that's what they say. Do you feel say. that way or no? I feel like it's hard to create when you don't know where you're going. You know, you're just figuring it all out and you're creating it and you're funding it. So it's hard to really plan when you're doing so many things. Yeah. I could just picture it, you know, like you're you're building this this business and you can lean more into consultancy. You can cut yeah. back your hours if you need to. You can focus more on the media side of things. You can do anything you want with this because it's it's yours, right? I'm I'm not naive anymore, so that's the problem. I'm not uh, naive. But you are naive of, of everything that you're about to take on. Oh my god! <laughs> if no, you've been naive that. for everything that you've done so far, trust me, you're going to be naive for everything you do in the future, right? Okay, all right. I guess I can do it then. <laughs> but but think how far that's taking you so far. Yeah, that naivety is like it's a gold. You don't know, so you're just like doing it all. You don't know. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>